love that part of the selling for Romeo and Juliet is, as it hath often been said, with great applause. Oh, like, yes. this is good. <laughs> you want to read this? Sell, right? and sell that book. <laughs> Humanities are a lively encounter with a source, and they force you to make that leap to say, I want to see the original, and I'm going to learn the skills that will allow me to understand the original. When I look at a book or I look at an object, I'm trying to understand not only its content, but its physical nature, and what, what in its physical characteristics inform me of the period in which it was printed. So it's, it's more than just the story. It's the story appears in a medium, and I'm very interested in what that medium tells me about the time in which the, which the object was printed. This paper is actually made from rag. They gathered old clothes and they boiled them in water, boiled the death out of them, and then they put this mush on top of a box that had wires in it, wires running horizontally and vertically. And as we look at this, paper that we've got here, if you look very closely, you can see the lines called the wire lines and the chain lines going across and up and down on that paper. But if you'll take hold of this modern piece of paper, not so. There are no chain lines, no water lines, you know, this is not made from rag. It's a very cheap kind of paper in contrast, and very short-lived in contrast to the very long-lived paper. That is paper that was made in the late 1590s probably. And this particular size is called quarto because of the way that the paper that was printed was folded. If we look over here on the left, and in a minute we'll look at a folio size, you'll see the difference. Right now you can tell that the folio page is much bigger. So to print the Shakespeare folio, the piece of paper that was printed on was folded like this after the printing had been done. So we would have page one, page two, page three, page four. And that format makes a very tall rectangular page, but a quarto format is much easier, more like a pocketbook today. So to make a quarto page as these are, and the quartos hold about 31 lines of text. You can turn and open to the text. You can see mm -hmm. in the text itself that it has approximately say 30, 31 lines of text usually. So that makes a smaller page and then the printing would be done with first what's called the outer form. These four pages would be printed though they're not in sequence and then the inner form would be printed. Not pages not in sequence but they, they are make a sequence when you fold the paper like this so we then have page one, page two, page three, page four and so on. Well, this is a copy of the first folio. The Folger Library has 82 copies of this very special book. It was the first attempt to collect Shakespeare's plays. It was printed in 1623. He died in 1616. So in the front of the first folio, um, one of the early pages is a letter that nobody ever reads. It's addressed to the great variety of readers, which in fact includes all of us, anybody who happens to read this book. They say, it's now public and you will stand for your privileges we know to read and censure. Do so, but buy it first. That doth best commend a book, the stationer says. I like that letter because it's part of what's called the paratext of a book. That is the material that surrounds the text. When most people go into Shakespeare, they skip everything until they get to the first play they want to read. Um, but it's very interesting to see, in terms of the time, how the plays were set up. And, and often books have these letters in the front to readers. I want to show you my favorite book in UW-Madison's Special Collections. It's this book from 1640, and it's Shakespeare's Poems, but I want to show you a few other books here in front of me um, so that I can explain to you why I love this book so much and, uh, and how it works. Um, when I say how it works, I mean as an interface. How do you interact with this book, and what does it do to kind of guide the way that you interact with it. Um, I said we've got a lot of books in front of us. I, I, I lied a little bit. These are obviously not books. We, we recognize that these are not books. Right? These, are, these are scrolls. These are scrolls from, um, uh, many of them from 
Uh, well, this one's from 1323, uh, from the reign of Edward II. And we have uh, a number of these scrolls here, and, and they're, they're, they're sewn together. We can, you know, they just, um, if I were to read this scroll, I would just start at the top and, and, and keep reading down. Now, you can't do that with a book. A book, a book doesn't read from top to bottom like that. You, you read your computer screen like that. We talk about scrolling on our computer screens, and that's something we get from this technology. And this is a technology, right? This, this object is, is very different. You don't read from top to bottom. This is a Bible, uh, and this is a Bible with chapters and verses in it, the way that people think of what a Bible looks like. When the Bible was in this format, it didn't have chapters and verses. You started at the beginning and you read to the end. So this isn't uh, just an object that changes the way that the Bible is read, the way that the Bible is, is, is printed or the way it can be quoted or understood and makes it accessible to a lot more people. It, it's also an object that, well, I mean, technically it's social media. It's, you can see that here. It's, it's got lots of writing in it. There are monsters on this page. There's also a lot of writing over on this side. You can see that at some point, someone cut off the bottom of the page. Maybe they needed some scrap paper. Uh, somebody's practicing numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six over here. And they're doodling. And they're, they've written their name here. There's a lot of, of activity going on here. And this is the book, I think, that my students most often will, will pull out their smartphones and have to take a picture of these monsters and post them on on Instagram, there, there's a way that the book itself becomes this uh, space, not only for sharing the ideas that were printed in it, but for creating new ideas around the margins. Most uh, people I tell this is my favorite book, they don't understand why. This is a more important book. This is a bigger book. It's the second folio, Shakespeare's second folio. And it's printed in 1632. The first folio uh, collected all of Shakespeare's plays into one volume, uh, some of which had never been collected before. We wouldn't have The Tempest if we didn't have the folio. This is a small, it's called an octavo. The case makes you think it's just as nice as what's here. Maybe a version of what's here, but it's not. In fact, it's, it's not quite a version of anything that's really what we call Shakespeare. In fact, there's some scholars who hate this book. That's part of the reason I love it. This is Shakespeare's poems. In 1609, Shakespeare printed the sonnets. We love the sonnets. We know the sonnets. We quote them. Many people memorize the sonnets. We try to impress people with the sonnets. The sonnets were a flop in 1609. Nobody read them. They didn't even get reprinted. 31 years later, a man named John Benson decided he would reprint the sonnets. But he doesn't call them sonnets, he calls them poems. And he reprints them in a completely different format, in a completely different way, that some people would say dumbs down the sonnets. And he takes these and he adds a to the reader section. In this to the reader section, he explains that he's reprinting these poems, he never calls them sonnets, that are serene and clear and elegantly plain. Now, if you've ever read the sonnets, those are not words, especially elegantly plain, those aren't words you'd use of the sonnets. But in 1609, they were seen as perhaps convoluted and, 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 and they weren't being read, they weren't reprinted, and so he's repackaging them as a different thing. What's really interesting to me is to think about this portable object. This object's not portable. This portable object alongside this portable object. One of my favorite apps on my iPad is an app called Shakespeare's Sonnets. And it does something to the sonnets very similar to what this 1640 volume does. It makes them accessible. I can carry this in my pocket. It rearranges them a little bit in ways that allow me to see something I haven't seen before.